Hi everyone, it's Emily. Welcome back to the 21 and Sensory podcast and on today's episode we're just having a little catch up, just me and you, so um, no guests, um, but keep an eye out because I've got some exciting guests coming on very soon. I wanted to chat through some life updates, um, some autism related books that I have been reading, um, also a Sensory Street project update which is quite exciting. And also, I want to discuss how you can make your own DIY sensory box. Um, It's something I did an illustration on on my Instagram, and I thought I would just chat through it a little bit more. So yeah, those are a few things I want to chat about. Um, I know that a few of you enjoy the more, like, rambly um, podcast episodes I do on my own, so hopefully you'll enjoy listening to this. Um, So I think the last time I did a catch-up episode was episode 50. Um, It was like a celebration of getting 250 podcast episodes, um, and it was just a catch-up with me. So um, maybe listen to that one before this one, so it will kind of make sense for life updates, potentially. Um, So I think in that episode, I mentioned that I was having to move. Um, Basically, I wasn't planning on moving, but um, my landlord wanted to sell the flat that I was in. So... Um, I had to move, (laughs) which wasn't ideal. Um, I hadn't even been there a year, but actually it was kind of ultimately a good thing because um, I moved, I found a new place in a different area, not too far from where I was, but it is a nicer area. So I do feel like better here. I feel like it's a safer area and stuff like that, which is important. Um, So it is a good thing. Um, I did initially find it quite hard because obviously like change is um it's difficult for anyone moving house is difficult for anyone but if you're autistic you might you might get this change is a whole like a whole other thing if you're autistic it's really difficult to wrap your head around and process it and not get upset by it so there was a lot of that kind of involved um it was quite tricky but i'm glad that i did it and i am um more settled now i moved I think it was the end middle to the end of march and i'm recording this on the 23rd of may so i've been here a while now um and it like looks and feels a bit more like my own space so that's a good thing um but yeah change is really difficult moving house is really difficult um i've talked about this before as well like i find it really difficult like when i used to live with my um family growing up like even them just like redecorating or decorating rooms and stuff was really difficult so yeah like even the little things like like even just like changing around a room for me is something really difficult and something that takes a while to get used to so moving was definitely a lot but I am ultimately glad that I did it (laughs) um so yeah so that's a little bit of a kind of update to episode 50 where I was like I am moving and I don't know where I'm going So at least now I am a bit more um, settled. Um, Also, I wanted to talk about like work. Obviously, um, I've spoken about it a bit before. Um, Work has been a tricky one for me. Um, If you don't know, I work full time as a graphic designer um, in house for a company. And I worked, um, I used to work all the time in an open plan office before the pandemic. Now looking back, I don't know how I did that because working for like two and a bit years from home was so much more like beneficial for me I know it doesn't work for everyone but for me I work really well from home so um kind of the past few months the company that I work for were like we need you in like one day a week and I was like "Mm, okay and then they were like actually we need you in two to three days a week and I managed to negotiate that down to two um which yeah it's tricky because obviously they knew that I could I worked okay in an open plan office before the pandemic, but so much has changed since then. And they don't know really that, um, like the um, struggles I have in an open plan office. Um, So yeah, it was a bit um, tricky is what I'm trying to get at. Um, So yeah, I kind of negotiated two days a week. And whilst kind of doing that, I was looking around at other jobs because I've been at this company for almost five years and I just kind of wanted to see what else was out there like I know that the grass isn't always like necessarily greener for moving but um you know there are obviously like benefits 
to moving elsewhere and like career progression and stuff like that I started looking around for a new job and it took like quite a few months of applying to places and getting rejected because they're obviously like um, I might not be the right fit or they might have lots of like a range of different candidates and people that fit a job better which I totally understand um, but I did eventually after I think it must have been like must have been looking for like six or seven months worth of like applying places just like periodically um, I did um, get interviewed at a few like different places and luckily it was all like remote so it was good it was scary but it was good practice because um, interviewing online I found was less scary than going in person to be interviewed um, so yeah it was good practice and like I got through like a few rounds of one of them and didn't get the job and was a bit gutted but then I thought you know it is really good practice um, and I just thought, you know, the more interview practice you can get, the better. Like, I don't think interview practice is a bad thing. Um, and, like, obviously I could tell from feedback and stuff, like, like I don't know if it was the skills that were letting me down or, like, you know, what what it was kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. So I did get through, through, like, a couple of rounds with one or, like, three or four rounds with another. Anyway, about maybe a month and a half ago, um, I was interviewing for a graphic designer role at a different company and I managed to make it through all the stages and I have accepted a new job and I am absolutely terrified. Um, I'm really scared about leaving my old company, I'm really scared about starting a new company. Um, I know it's a good thing and I've talked about it at length with my family and my parents to the point where they're probably like sick of me and talking about it but there wasn't any like career progression opportunities at my current company because I was the only designer um whereas at this new company there is more like options um for career progression which is a good thing um but yeah I'm just really scared um the new job is more remote I do have to go into the office like every so often um and I'm also hoping that I can be like upfront about being autistic and dyslexic um, from the start so I know it's a good thing it's really terrifying I've also managed to move and get a new job within like two months which is ridiculous like I don't I wasn't I wasn't planning on moving and I wasn't like necessarily planning on getting a new job I know I was interviewing places but I never thought I'd get a job offer um, so yeah so basically now I won't have to go into the office two days a week it will be like much less um and I think that will suit me better obviously it's really scary starting a new job um for anyone and it's really nerve-wracking for anyone but as I said before with moving it's just a little bit different if you're autistic like dealing with life things it's um it, it feels much more overwhelming it feels not like isolated but maybe a bit just because I just feel like no one can f like step into my shoes and feel how I like feel that or like my family and friends kind of thing like it's really hard to express that I don't feel proud for getting the job and I don't feel like when people are like oh congratulations on your new job like I don't feel that and I think like I've always had issues with like labeling my feelings I think I've spoken about this like alexithemia kind of idea of not being able to like understand or label your own feelings and I definitely have that going on like I just can't feel things or label things within myself so there's just a lot <laughs> a lot to it and also I am struggling with my mental health a bit so there's that added in so we've got a nice like combination of like being autistic mental health not being great and new job so yeah I'm just gonna have to try my best as I always do I'm trying not to be too hard on myself but I just keep getting really overwhelmed by the prospect of starting somewhere new and getting to um, know new people yeah so I think that was everything I wanted to say about moving and work and new job and stuff like I'm, I'm really scared and I have so much imposter syndrome going on but I know that 
everyone does to some certain extent and like none of us have it all figured out and I've met a couple of the people that I will be working with and they seem really nice so I'm just trying desperately to stay positive but I think also I kind of need to sort out my mental health at the same time because if I feel better in myself I'll feel better about the job potentially um I've talked about this before as well like there's so much overlap with autism and mental health and it's really hard to know what is like affecting me more in a moment or in a day like it's really hard to know if I feel a certain way because I'm overwhelmed like you know sensory wise because of um you know the environment I'm in or something like that or if it is more like mental health like anxiety depression so it's really difficult to know like what is causing what is what I'm trying to say um yeah so I don't know it's just tricky and I'm trying to stay positive and not freak out um but like I don't know it it will be um I think it'll be a learning curve and everyone that I've spoken to has says that it's too good an opportunity to not like try it I'm trying to hold on to the fact that if I give it a good go and it's not for me like I can leave like I'm not like tied to this company if that makes sense and I think I don't know I didn't have that view I felt like if I accepted a job I was like you know had to stay there for a certain amount of time but I don't and it's only through talking through other people that I've realized that you know you can just try it out and see how it goes and I might love it I might love it at the moment I'm absolutely terrified but I might love it so um yeah I really recommend talking to your friends and family if you're if you're wanting to make a career move, if you're wanting to move house, if you're wanting to do anything different. <laughs> like it's helped me so much to bounce off ideas and I did like a pros and cons list of like the current company versus the new company and that was really helpful like visually. It's something I've done a lot and it's something my mum gets me to do a lot. It's like pros and cons of different situations or new things. Um it is really helpful to visually see like oh, these are the pros of starting, these are the potential cons or the potential things I might find scary. Um, It does really help, so I recommend doing that. Um, Yeah, what else do I want to talk about? Um, I kind of touched upon mental health a little bit, and I said that I've been struggling a bit. Um, In my previous catch-up episode, episode 50, I mentioned that I was coming off medication, or I might have finished coming off medication, I can't remember. Anyway, Um, In January, I managed to come off the two, um, like, medications I was on. I was on um, an anxiety one and a, like, antipsychotic for anxiety and depression. Um, If you go back to that episode, I explain, like, why I was put on them and how long I was on them and stuff like that. It's quite a long, um, (laughs) like, background story. Anyway, so I managed to come off them in January. And it's only like the past like three or four weeks, so like a month now, that I've been struggling with my mental health again. So I think that I might have to go back on like a small dose of something. And it is something that I've read a lot about, and so is my mum, that like a lot of people really struggle to come off um, like antidepressants, anxiety meds and antipsychotics just because... They are really hard to come off and the side effects like I found were quite difficult as well Um, but a lot of people do like just take a small dose and find that that kind of helps keep them level and that's what I'm kind of thinking. Um, When like I spoke to my doctor he did say that you know I might need to factor in the fact that due to my autism that I might just need that constant background like dosage just to be able to cope and I did appreciate that and I did um, take that on board as something that I might need to do if I do struggle, and I am struggling, so I think that is um, an option that I'm going to try and consider. Maybe not go back on the ones that I was on, because in the previous episode I mentioned this, that um, they don't really prescribe the ones that I was on, um, because I was prescribed them when I was like 16, (laughs) Um, so yeah, I think they'd put me on something different. So yeah it's really tricky with mental health because like you feel like you have it like sometimes you feel like you know you're in the real pits and you can't see a way out and then you start to feel better and then you're like oh is this medicine working anymore or is it just kind of you don't know what it is or isn't doing especially like for me I had been on it for like 10 years 
um, actually kind of 11 or 12 years now. Um, so yeah, it was really hard to know what it was and wasn't doing. And until you come off it, you don't realise, you know, how much it's, it like helps or doesn't help with sleep or like helps or doesn't help with mood and things like that. And it's so different for everyone. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting, but it's really tricky. Um, so yeah, I want to try and get on top of my mental health because if I am more stable and more level, then I think I will be able to manage things like a new job a little bit better. Obviously it will still be difficult, but just having that base, like, you know, I don't know, feeling more stable will help. So yeah. So those are kind of the life updates. I feel, when I say kind of the life updates, those were big life updates. I've moved and I have a new job. Um, so I start the new job in like two, three weeks. Um, yeah. So um, maybe I will check back in and do another episode in like, I don't know, a couple of months time and see, like just update anyone who's interested um, about how it's gone and stuff and like whether I disclose like being autistic and stuff. I really want to. Um, yeah. So um, what else would I like to talk about? Um, I mentioned that I wanted to talk about a Sensory Street update. If you don't know what Sensory Street is, it is an Oxford University research project that I'm working on as a research assistant. Um, if you go back a couple of episodes, I keep saying this, like, go back a couple of episodes. But if you do go back a couple of episodes, I um, did an entire episode talking to some of the Sensory Street team. And that explains the entire project, if you're interested. Um, so, yeah, we, um, we're, we like, excited to announce that we're going to be hosting our sensory street immersive event at Pearl in Dagenham and Pearl stands for Person Environment Activity Research Laboratory. Um, it's um, UCL's first net zero carbon building and it is a unique facility that explores the way people engage with their environment. Um, so UCL is University College London for anyone that doesn't know. Um, so in the past, they've like housed all sorts of different environments, like train stations, high streets, and even like a town square. Um, so as a team, we're going to be working with them to create an immersive supermarket inspired experience, which is really exciting. Um, so yeah, the um, location gives us the ability to engage with people's senses in like a range of different ways. So through things such as like flooring, lighting, sound, smells, and like so much more so that's going to be quite exciting and um, we're going to use the information that we've collected over the past year to really make it reflect autistic people's experiences and perspectives as much as possible. So our event is going to be held during um, the 14th to the 16th of July and free tickets are going to be available soon. Um, so we're hoping to make the event free for everyone but we may have to like limit the amount of um, people in the space at certain times just to ensure that people can like properly explore what we've created. If you'd like to learn more about this immersive event um, just keep checking back on our website or follow our social media pages um, to find out when the tickets are released in the next few weeks. I will also pop those in the show notes. Um, so yeah just keep checking back but I'm really excited because it's like a properly like sensory experience that we're building and for me, as someone who's autistic and has sensory processing difficulties, it's going to be really interesting to see how people engage with this environment. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Okay, so another thing I wanted to quickly mention was that on April 5th, I reached 20,000 followers over on my Instagram. <laughs> um, I just wanted to throw it in. I don't blow my own trumpet a lot, but I really appreciate um, everyone's ongoing support of my work and all the kind comments and messages and just like general feedback I get it really helps keep me going and it motivates me further um yeah so thank you very much if you do follow along on my Instagram or any social media or even if you are listening to this podcast I really appreciate it okie dokie so next section of this podcast is dedicated to books and specifically autistic or autism related books that I've read so I'm just going to go through a load of books that I've recently read and just kind of summarise um, like a bit about either their plot or just like an overview of them and also like mention 
just what I personally thought of them as well. So I'm going to start with Can You See Me by Libby Scott and Rebecca Westcott. So it's a collection of three books um, written by them both, so they're like co-authors. So um, there's Can You See Me, Do You Know Me and Ways to Be Me. So it's like three um, books at the moment. So I'm going to explain a little bit about them. So um, with diary entries written by 11-year-old Libby Scott based on her own experience of autism, this pioneering book written in collaboration with author Rebecca Westcott has been widely praised for its realistic portrayal of autism. Tally is 11 years old and she's just like her friends. Well, sometimes she is. If she tries really hard to be because there's something that makes Tally not the same as her friends, something she can't cover up no matter how hard she tries. Tally is autistic. Tally's autism means that there are things that bother her even though she wishes they didn't. It means that some people misunderstand her and feel frustrated by her. People think that because Tally's autistic, she doesn't realise what they're thinking, but Tally sees and hears and notices all of it. And honestly, that's not the easiest thing to live with. Endearing, insightful and warmly uplifting, Can You See Me is a story of autism, empathy and kindness that will touch readers of all ages. So yeah, um, Tally is the main character and just a lot was flooding back to me about the hell that was my school years as someone who didn't know that they were autistic and masked her way through. Um, It's really a brilliant book and I was really excited to read the rest of the series. So I bought the first one, Can You See Me? and I just loved it. So then I read the next book and absolutely loved that and it was really interesting to see how like Tally grows and really stands up for herself and it was just it was fascinating to have all these little entries by um, Libby about um, kind of Tally's inner thoughts and then I joined my local library um, which is like near to where I live in my new local area and I um borrowed the third book and it was really exciting because like um I haven't like been part of a library since like secondary school um and um I got a little membership card and I can borrow books and ebooks and listen to audiobooks um sorry this is an aside I'm just very excited about being a library member and I really recommend it <laughs> um so yeah I um managed to uh, borrow the last book which was really great um and Again, I really enjoyed it. I read it so quickly and it was like this this set of books, I almost didn't want, like, I didn't want them to end, basically. And this leads on to the fact that there's a fourth one coming. I'm really excited. It's called All the Pieces of Me and it is the fourth powerful story of autism, empathy and kindness from um, Libby and Rebecca. Um, so the books have this interesting kind of background because... Um, Libby, one of the authors, her mum shared a short piece of her writing online and it went viral with like tens of thousands of people saying that Libby's writing helped them to understand autism for the first time and this is kind of how the books came about and it's really interesting because you do get that insight of someone who is autistic and Rebecca's um, writing as well around the diary entries are just brilliant and I think it's such a a brilliant idea to co-author because you get like a sense of both of them like really like chipping in and like working out how Tally's feeling and it's just like I read the set of books and I was like I really want to give my mum these books because it really explained how I was struggling through secondary school and primary school but I just couldn't put into words how I was struggling and I just felt like these books just said it all like so like beautifully um so I might try and get my mum to read them. Um, but yeah, I really recommend it. Um, I'd say it is suitable for like younger readers as well, like primary school age readers, um, maybe like eight or nine upwards. And I enjoyed it and I'm 28. So um, I can definitely recommend it to like um, parents, carers, um, family and friends. It's really interesting. And you just really get an insight into the inner workings of Tally's brain and everything that she is going through all at once um so yeah I really recommend them and then the next book is Dara McAnulty's Diary of a Young Naturalist I'm sorry if I said Dara's surname wrong 
Um, so Gara opens up about his autism and it's like interrelation to his love of the natural world as well as providing fascinating practical advice and knowledge about British wildlife. Diary of a Young Naturalist portrays Dara's intense connection to the natural world and his perspective as a teenager juggling exams and friendships alongside a life of campaigning. In writing this book, Dara explains, I have experienced challenges but also felt incredible joy, wonder, curiosity and excitement. In sharing this journey, my hope is that people of all generations will not only understand autism a little bit more, but also appreciate a child's eye view on our delicate and changing biosphere. So I absolutely love this book um, and the way that Dara like so eloquently explains nature in like wonderful detail like it's amazing it really like feels like you're in the same place and you're looking and experiencing the same things as him. Um, I just recommend you going and buying it now or borrowing it now it's it's so beautifully written and there's a lot of like family stuff in it as well and like family dynamics and how like Dara and his siblings and his mum and dad all kind of um, communicate and how they kind of work out routines and um, I think Dara also moves house in this um, book as well so that's also interesting to understand what he goes through with that but there's just all this beautiful like intricate writing about wildlife and just nature and how important it is to get out into the world and it just it made me feel like I said like I was really there with him um so yeah I really recommend it it's beautifully written and um yeah let me know if you do read it and if you feel the same way <laughs> and then along a like similar kind of um genre I would say is Wintering by Catherine May um, it's a poignant and comforting meditation on the more like fallow periods of life so times when you kind of want to retreat to care for and like repair yourself um, Catherine shows us how to come through these times with like the wisdom of knowing that like the seasons like winters and summers that there's a real like ebb and flow of life and again a bit like Dara Catherine writes so beautifully about like wildlife and surrounding like nature and how important it is to like experience these things but also to take time to recover for yourself and that like it's all about like finding the like little moments of joy like not only out in nature but like just having like cozy nights in like experiencing like a, a great book in front of I don't know a fire with a cup of tea or something like that like it's all about like the little moments and enjoying the little things for what they are and I first came across Catherine's writing um through the electricity of every little thing I really recommend that book as well it's something that I've spoken about um I think on my blog and on a previous podcast as well um so yeah I love her writing okay next book is perfectly weird perfectly you by Dr Camilla Pang might recognize Camilla's name because I've had her on the podcast and I was really excited to receive a copy of this um, book it's a brand new children's book and it was released on March 17th um, this year 2022 um, I read Camilla's Explaining Humans book last year and I literally couldn't wait to read this one um, also Camilla very kindly mentioned me in the resources section in her book um, along with the fabulous Abigail Balf who I've also had on this podcast just you know little little group of people who've been on my podcast um yeah it was amazing like when she reached out to ask me I was like beyond excited because it means so much to me that my work is seen as a resource to others um but having said that this is a very honest review of her book I loved it it's so like accessible to um so many people and again it's like a book that can be read by anyone like primary school upwards I really enjoyed it um, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So um, Camilla is here to share her scientific survival guide with you so you can grow up with the courage to be yourself no matter how different you feel or how tricky you might find it to connect. Because the hard part of growing up isn't dealing with other people, their opinions, their popularity or their exam results. No, the hard part is you. Learning who you are and what makes you tick. And the really hard part is accepting that it's completely normal to be perfectly weird. 
In fact, it's essential to growing up happy. So yeah, that's a little bit more about the book. Um, really recommend it. There's so many brilliant um, like autistic um, related books or like books written by autistic authors. Um, these are just some of them, um, but I'm really enjoying um, reading them because I feel like there's just like more and more coming out and it's so brilliant to see so many people's different like um, styles come out in them. Okay, the next book is The Independent Woman's Handbook for Super Safe Living on the Autistic Spectrum by Robin Stewart. So a little bit more about Robin. Robin is 25 years old and is autistic. Robin is an autism trainer, mentor and consultant and artist. She travels internationally giving talks to educators, therapists and autistic people. She's spoken about autism at the House of Commons, in the national and international press, on radio and television, as well as annually at the University of California, Los Angeles. Robin also helps to raise awareness as a National Autistic Society ambassador. So this is a little bit more about the book. Certain characteristics of autism, such as difficulty understanding social cues, make many women vulnerable to potential dangerous situations. Robin has written this supportive guide to help all women on the autistic spectrum live independently, make their own choices in life and be safe while doing so. This book will provide you with the knowledge to recognise potential risks to your own personal safety and the skills and strategies required to avoid and overcome them. Informed by a survey of and interviews with women on and off the autistic spectrum, it explores common safety issues encountered by women and offers practical advice to help you stay safe and supported in your independence. Topics covered include friendships, relationships and sex, alcohol and drugs, money and employment, and staying safe outside the home and online. This handbook is your guide to super safe living as an independent woman and will help you to stay safe whilst living life to the full. It may also be of interest to your family, friends and carers, giving them insight into life on the spectrum and confidence that you will enjoy your independence in an informed and safe manner. So this was a really interesting book. It was actually something that my mum saw at um, our local like National Autistic Society Centre. Um, as I've mentioned before, my brother goes to an autism day centre. There's a whole episode on him as well. I keep referring back to old episodes, but there is a whole episode on him um, if you want to find out more about him. But yeah, he goes to a National Autistic Society day centre. And my mum actually saw this book on their little library section and asked... Um, the lovely people there if I could borrow it and they were like absolutely um so she brought it back home for me so I'm going to be very honest about this book it is a very heavy read and I did find that it does go into a lot of detail um I found some of it a little bit triggering just because as I mentioned some of the topics are quite like heavy topics and can be triggering so I would say if you are planning to read it you can like always skip chapters or skip sections um it is very thorough and it is very um blunt in the descriptions of um like things to do with relationships for example so just kind of be aware of that um it might be helpful for someone to read it before you just to kind of not vet it for you but you know if you do have certain triggers and things like i missed a couple of bits because i just knew that it would you know maybe me kind of overthink things um so but it is a brilliant book and some some chapters or some sections I did skip just because it there were kind of bits that I was aware of so for example I felt like I didn't need to read the kind of bits about um like money um and also like like staying safe online because I do I do kind of understand that already um, I definitely skimmed over it, but I knew that I kind of didn't, those bits weren't as relevant for me. So it is a really good book in terms of like dipping in and out of. Um, it was written quite a while ago, so you might find that some of the wording or some of the ways that things are referred to are a little bit dated, but that is literally just because it was written quite a while ago. Um, so I would try and kind of disregard that if that makes sense. Um, but it was really helpful and it goes into so much detail about how to stay safe and how like I don't know just how people how people work and what a safe relationship or a safe friendship looks like and I think that's really important to understand um, I think it's a brilliant book for parents and carers as well it gives you so much information and so much like 
background knowledge and um, Robin interviewed so many different people and it was really interesting to see like quotes from them and understand like their background and the things that they've kind of learned along the way of you know living um so it is it is a brilliant book it is it's heavy and it covers a lot of heavy subjects so yeah i think i would definitely recommend it i think it is a really important read um it is hard hitting in places and it is more of a like it's more of a manual to life and i think a lot of autistic people i've spoken to feel like they need a manual for life and this feels like it it feels like something you can dip in and out of and i learned something throughout it like i learned bits and pieces along the way and even if you do already know some of it like i did it's helpful to just go over and just just remember and realize things that you need to always be aware of um so yeah i really recommend the book um yeah so i think the last thing i want to talk about is um the diy sensory vlogs so you might have seen this on my instagram i did a drawing of it and i basically wanted to share some top tips for making your own diy sensory box so a diy sensory box um let me explain the kind of concept um so i have my own sensory box and i'm literally talking a plastic tub um and it's kind of evolved over the years um because i've been able to like tolerate more things but also less things sensory wise so Basically, think of it as a box that you can dip into when you're in basically any mood because it can be helpful like when you're feeling overwhelmed or burnt out, but like especially when you just want to experience a little bit of joy and indulge in something like a visual stim that you love. Um, so basically, the concept is you start with a plastic tub or storage box. So I found the one without a lid or like an open top one can be handy if you want to dip in and out of it quickly. Um, I found having a lid on mine meant I actually stored stuff on top of it and it also meant I forget that I had it and I'd end up not using it. So open top, I believe, is the way to go. So I've suggested a few things that you might want to pop into your own sensory box in my drawing and also I'm going to talk about it more in detail now. So fidget toys. Any fidget toys you already have, think of this box as a collection of lots of different sensory items you already own. So there's no need to buy anything new unless you want to. So just put a range of them in. Just put your favourite fidget toys in. Or, if you don't have fidget toys, favourite pen that you click or, you know, mess with. Favourite, I don't know, like button or small, like toy or anything that you fiddle with is what I'm getting at. And then, favourite books. Why not put a couple of your all-time favourite books, magazines, activity books, notebooks, anything you can read or do, throw it in the box. Next up, safe snacks. Pop in any go-to snacks you love that obviously won't go out of date too soon. So I like putting in anything crunchy like crisps or anything that's like the right sort of chewy like Skittles or fruit pastels or mints. Honestly, it's really handy when you need some sensory input and it helps as a distraction just to know that you've got this like stash somewhere. And then visual stims. Anything visual. Literally anything visual. So for example bubble or liquid timers, spinning fidget toys, like that sort of thing. It can even be like a visual, like say you love the look of a fabric or you love the look of even something like wrapping paper or something or something holographic or anything, anything you like the look of, throw it in there. And then headphones, throw some ear defenders, earplugs, headphones, earphones in there. Maybe throw in some nice textures. So for example, a favorite feeling fabric, like for me, I have some sequin things in mine as I like the visual of sequins and also the texture of like moving them back and forth. So it can be like a texture you like the look of, but also the feel of. And then calm scents. So maybe things like essential oils and candles. Um, only scents you like, obviously, and can tolerate. Um, I personally don't have that many in my box because I don't really like like strong smells. I think I have like some lemon essential oil that I just kind of smell I don't like put it anywhere I just like smell it out of the little pot and then soft items things like soft toys squishies soft blankets fabric offcuts that sort of thing like soft like plush toys anything you like the feel of or the weight of like a weighted toy that's also good and then yeah you should then have a nice box full of bits and pieces 
If you want to see an example, you can have a look at the illustration on my Instagram, which I will link down below. Also, I very much appreciate that not everything will fit into a sensory box, but I do have a solution to that, a sensory corner. There's a video on my YouTube channel, again I will link it down below in my show notes, and it's all about my version of this if you're interested, but essentially it's like a dedicated corner that you can set up in any room, and you can really tailor it to your own sensory needs, and include bigger things like, I don't know, a nice comfy rug, or interesting lighting, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, why not upgrade your sensory um, DIY box to a sensory corner? <laughs> Okie dokie, I have almost been talking for an hour. These things go very quickly, as always. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this bit of a catch up. Um, and hopefully I will be back soon with another catch up episode. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoy um, my episodes with lots of lovely guests. And I will hopefully speak to you all soon. Bye.